This is Red Podcast, episode number 242. I know the title sounds controversial. It's not. I'll explain it. That's coming up. This is the Red Podcast. How to reach more people, establish your authority, and deliver your message. Here's your host, David Hooper. Every morning I wake up, try to avoid it for as long as possible, but eventually I get on social media, get on the internet. It seems like there's another controversy. A lot of them lately, they've been related to race. This is an episode about race. It's also an episode about how race relates to marketing. I'm going to give you some general marketing lessons related to communication with your audience. And I'm also going to talk about the history of race and marketing. That's where the title comes from. Controversial? Maybe. But when you hear the story behind it, it's all going to make sense. This is the Red Podcast, the podcast for experts. If you're a blogger, speaker, marketer, podcaster, or somebody with a message to spread, this is the podcast for you. I help you reach your audience expand your authority, and deliver your message with impact. This episode is brought to you by Ripple. For everything that's bad about social media, there's 10 great things. One of them is it brings people together. It starts conversations. And if you're looking to do that about your message and your brand, you want to check out Ripple. It's designed for small businesses. It will help you attract business and engage with existing customers. One of the things I love about it is when you design something on the Ripple app, It automatically shares it to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. Over 200 design templates make creating your professional ad easy. Right now, as a listener of Red, you can get a free week of Ripple, a seven-day free trial just for you. Ripple.com slash Red. That's R-I-P-L dot com slash Red to get your free trial today. Let me give you some personal background so you know where I'm coming from on this message. I was born in 1972 in Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in a mixed neighborhood About 90% of the friends that I had in my neighborhood, black. Next door neighbor, black. Played tennis at a local park, which would be considered a black park. In fact, considered so black, the NAACP came to visit, talked to the kids who were playing tennis. I was the only white kid there. It's Kind of a unique experience for a white guy. You ask a black guy, hey, do you know what it's like to be the only black guy in the room? He's going to say, yeah. But ask your white friends, you know what it's like to be the only white guy in the room? Few people have that experience. And even fewer, when you're 12 or 13 years old, have the experience of being pitched by the NAACP. I tell you all of this to say that I really didn't think much about race when I was growing up. I mean, I knew it existed. I mean, obviously, when you look different than everybody else around you, you know it exists. But I didn't think much about it. Made the assumption that everybody thought like I did. That was not the case. I had a friend of mine from church come over one time, just dropped by for a visit with his family. He's outside playing with him. My neighbor, the black kid, he's out playing in his yard. My friend looks at me. He said, I didn't know you live in a neighborhood. Kind of shocking and hurtful. I didn't really, uh, I didn't really hang out with that guy much after that. On this episode... I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into race relations in the United States. I've got a special guest. She was also from my neighborhood. I was doing something else with her. I thought I'd include her here because something that she said to me relates to this topic. State your name for me. Would you like my full name, my birth name, my married name? Okay, have you ever listened to NPR? I have. Okay, and do you know how when they interview somebody? Yes. And you'll hear, hello, my name is? My name is Martha Hooper. Okay. And are you or are you not my mother? I am your mother. Yes, that is my mother. By the way, if you want more hilarious level checks and outtakes from that interview, got them on the back end of this episode. Both of my parents were born in the 40s. My father in Middle Tennessee, my mother in East Tennessee, Both of them went to segregated high schools. Didn't know any black people. They weren't racist. They just didn't know any black people. And schooling was one of the things that I talked to my mother about. She went to college in Nashville at Peabody, which is the teacher college for Vanderbilt University. 
I asked her about her dorm, and here's what she said. I'm curious about your dorm that you stayed in. Explain the dorm situation, what it was called, and how that worked. Well, um, when I came to Peabody as a freshman, the living choices were two and then later three women's dorms. One of them was um, North Hall. One of them was UDC, uh, which would have been South Hall, but it was funded in part by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. I needed every amount of scholarship money, every benefit I could get, because it was really something for me to be able to leave town, actually, to go, go to college. But there were scholarship rooms in UDC dorm that were available to any woman who had a relative who fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. So when the fall term began, I had not, uh, I didn't have a relative, I hadn't located a relative, but my dad was in touch with the War Department. And after spending uh, a week in North Hall uh, with a roommate from New York, which was an experience in itself for a girl from Tennessee, I learned that I had a relative who had indeed fought for the Confederacy. So that entitled me to, I think it was $200 a year or $200, it must have been $200 a year, price break on a dorm room in Confederate Hall. I thought nothing about that. The funny part of that story to me has always been that my relative fought for the Confederacy only three weeks and (laughs) deserted to the Union. That's still a laughable story, but it qualified me, and I was very, very grateful. That was in the 60s, and a lot of America, especially the South, lived like that. Again, not racist. That's just the way things were. People were segregated, even if they were open-minded. Because of that, there was a lot of confusion about other races. And that affected marketing. You may be familiar with the AMC series called Mad Men about the advertising industry. There was an interesting pitch on Mad Men. Admiral Television was in need of a new ad campaign. And during the research trying to develop that ad campaign, the Mad Men found a new market. Check out this pitch. So, Harry here is an expert in media. Television. The air, not the sets. Now, Admiral Television sales are flat. We know that. But as we studied your indices, we realized that they're not flat everywhere. In fact, among Negroes, sales are actually growing. We know that, too. You do? No, of course you do. These are your numbers, but I think we've discovered an interesting strategy. This is Ebony. Buy Negroes. Four Negroes. Jet. Space in these magazines costs far less than what you currently spend. Daily newspapers that go just to this market for pennies on the dollar. And? Shift a portion of the media budget from lower indexing white areas to this market where it can do more good. They already like it. We can make them buy more by increasing the exposure. A 5% sales bump in Detroit alone would make you the same profit as a 2% increase system-wide. And ads on television geared to this market and white markets will have double the effect. A Negro ad and a white ad. So, Campbell, you're making twice the ads for us now. No. Do them together. Integrated. I don't think that's legal. Of course it's legal. Look... This conversation is not worth having. Who's to say that Negroes aren't buying Admiral Televisions because they think white people want them? I'm going to throw another disclaimer in here because I know it's such a hot topic. Sometimes we are in a situation that we think is wrong. We feel it's wrong. But we don't know what to do. I think we're in those situations right now. We don't know what to do. What do you do? I think that we're all doing the best that we can. But when you're getting bad information 
about certain races, certain situations, certain topics, when that's being fed to you, how can you really know what's going on? It's one of the reasons that I think podcasting is so important and why I'm putting this topic here. I think podcasting is important because it opens conversations. This isn't the mass media. This isn't designed to get massive ratings or keep big advertisers happy. This is designed to have a conversation, which is what I'm having right now. So I'm not being judgmental or accusatory when I say this, because I think we're all in this situation. But back in the 60s, we didn't have these ways of communicating. We didn't have diversity like we have now. We didn't have access to different types of people. It was even worse in the 50s. So here's where the title of this podcast comes from. In 1954, a film was produced that tried to change race relations when it came to marketing. That film, it was called The Secret of Selling the Negro. It was hosted by a man named Bob Trout. I want you to imagine this. Thin guy. Suit. Jet black hair. Looks like he had some kiwi shoe polish. Rubbed it through his hair, rubbed it through his mustache. That was the only thing black about him. White guy. Looked very similar to Walt Disney. And in this film, he gives you the secret of selling to the Negro. Three habits. Check this out. But now, wait a minute. If the Negro market is so big and easy to reach, why aren't more companies going out after it? Well, often because of the feeling that there's something entirely different, unusual about selling to the Negro. But is it really so different? What do salesmen say? The successful salesmen who do a good job of selling in Negro communities. How do you go about getting the order? How do I get the order? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't do anything. <laughs> anything different, that is. <laughs> I've been calling on these accounts long enough to know that the Negro just wants to be treated like everybody else. No matter who you're calling on, a little friendliness and courtesy help a lot. But naturally, anybody resents being patronized or talked down to. So I usually call a man Mr. Brown, Mr. Smith, or Mr. whatever his name is, until he tells me to call him by his first name. And, of course, I always stick to business. I stay away from talk about race or religion or politics. That goes for talk about Negro celebrities, too. You know, this business about what good prize fighters and singers the Negroes are. Who cares? When a guy's in business, no matter what color his skin is, he's interested in making a living, in making money. That's uppermost in his mind. I guess maybe what I'm saying is that I try to help any way I can, sometimes with displays or ad materials or an idea once in a while. The important thing is that if it helps push sales for the dealer, it helps push them for me, too. Hmm. Handle the Negro account just like any of your others. Don't patronize. Stick to business. Get interested in the account. Pitch in and help any way you can. Sounds like pretty good sales advice. That's the secret of selling the Negro. Well, how about it? What do you think of this new market? It can open new outlets for you and for everybody who sells goods or services. Imagine that. This was mind-blowing, though. Earlier in this film, he talks about misconceptions that people had about marketing to black people, working with black people, having them in their stores. Listen to this. All too often, though, they are overlooked prospects. Why? Because of some good, valid reason? No. They're overlooked because of mistaken ideas, because of out-of-date ideas about how the Negro lives and how he buys. The truth of the matter is that the Negro lives pretty much the same as other folks. He buys pretty much the same way, too. But just the same, a lot of old doubts and opinions keep cropping up over and over again. Oh, I don't like to do business with Negroes. They're drifters. You can't keep track of them. Yes, although a lot of people think that way, the truth is that one out of every three Negro families living in cities today owns its own home. That figure comes directly from the United States Bureau of Census. Uh, maybe so, but Negroes are poor credit risks. Not more of a credit risk than any other group. Actually, the Negro home buyer meets his payments faithfully, 
often more faithfully than other race groups in the same economic level. That's the information we got from people who ought to know, the National Association of Real Estate Boards. Well, maybe, but I've always heard that Negroes buy shoddy, poor-quality merchandise. No, it's just the other way around. According to leading researchers, in proportion to population and income, Negroes buy more quality products than any other comparable United States group. You see, there are a lot of confused notions about the Negro customer. But when you dig right down and find out about them, they just don't hold water. Negroes own homes. They meet their payments faithfully. They buy good brands of merchandise. So why let a lot of old-fashioned ideas hurt profits? Take a look at the real facts. It's hard to believe people would think like that, but they did. And that happened because of misinformation and not having these conversations. So many lessons from this film. One, talk to your customers. They'll tell you what they want. They'll tell you how they want to be treated. And that's the second lesson. Treat people with respect. The third lesson, if you can get in with one person in a community you may be able to get in with other people in that community. I think the big lesson here, though, this film, The Secret of Selling the Negro, it was made by Johnson Publishing, the owners of Ebony Magazine, the same magazine mentioned in the Mad Men pitch. Now, obviously, they wanted to get people to consider buying ads in their magazines, but it was bigger than that. This film encouraged merchants, companies, and others to advertise to black people in general. It also told companies how black people wanted to be treated to treat them well. Don't sell them cheap stuff. Sell them good stuff. Sell them brand names. Treat them like you'd want to be treated. Show them respect. And that affected culture. And the way they did it, that's the really big marketing lesson here. It wasn't patronizing to people who might have had misconceptions. It wasn't militant. It wasn't aggressive. It was sneaky. It was taking things down to their level where these people were, and it was lifting them up to a higher level. It was saying, yeah, we get it. We get it. You've heard these misconceptions, but that's not true. It backs it up with data, and it shows them a better way of doing business, one that's more respectful. It also shows them a way of doing business that's going to help them make more money. That's the sneak. It focused on the bottom line, money. Did it change the minds of anybody concerning race? Who knows? But it did help to get the end result of people being treated better. I want you to think about these two things when you do your marketing. One, how can you talk to the people you want to influence using their language? How can you take things down to their level and bring them up to yours? And two, what's the best way for you to get the results that you're looking for? Sometimes it's by being sneaky. Sometimes it's not going for a big win, but several smaller wins. Small wins over time get big results. Ebony Magazine is still around. Johnson Publishing makes about $90 million annually. Today, the thought of black people having money, that's not so ridiculous. It's also not weird for us to have these conversations. Thank you for being part of it. I'd love to hear from you about this issue. I'd love to know how you're going down to a certain level, trying to bring people up, make their lives better, and make the world a better place. Reach out to me. Redpodcast.com is the website. While you are there, you can subscribe. Top left corner, I've got four ways to do it. I've got an app for iPhone, app for Android. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music. One click is all it takes to make sure you never miss an episode. If you like this episode, please tell a friend, and I'll see you on the next episode of Red Podcast. You've been listening to Red Podcast. Never miss an episode. Subscribe now with your iPhone, Android, or via RSS at redpodcast.com. Okay, I would like to suggest that perhaps you try one of the stylistic great clips. Dad comes home looking pretty good, and you know he doesn't have a lot of hair to work with. (laughs) And did that register? One, two, three, testing. (laughs) Okay. All right. I don't think you'll be able to do this interview. All right, Mom. Your job will be Mom, not to laugh. Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get serious here. Yes. This is a serious conversation. Yes. Okay. State your name for me. 
Would you like my full name, my birth name, my married name? Okay. Have you ever listened to NPR? I have. Okay. And do you know how when they interview somebody? Yes. And you'll hear, hello, my name is? My name is Martha Hooper. Okay. And are you or are you not my mother? I am your mother. Okay. I was there when you were born. There were witnesses. Okay. Listen, I'm going to get serious now. I gave birth to you. You are my firstborn. I'm going to get serious now. So I, I would like to hear a little playback to hear, see how that's registering. It's registering. I can see that it's on. Well, the, normally they can't beam me up. I, I just did that. You see what I did? No, I was not paying attention. I was, I, I was watching your face. I was doing the knob here. Yeah. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. I have a lot. I'm full of information. All right. Thanks for doing this.